I will trust in you. That's uh, kind of the center, kind of the acorn, if you please, of the message for this morning. So I'm so grateful for the song that we just got through singing. I will trust in you. Let the weak say I am strong in the strength of the Lord. That's, um, that's encouraging, isn't it? There are some weak people here this morning. Let the weak say that I am strong this morning in the strength of the Lord. I will trust in you. And then the, when the song that they sang before that, all together lovely, you're all together lovely, all together wonderful to me. That's the Lord, isn't he? And uh, that's, as I say, keep those in mind because that's kind of the acorn of the service this morning, the, the sermon this morning. Take your Bibles, if you will, with me and turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. And uh, if you didn't bring your Bible, we have the words on the screen. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, <clears throat> beginning with verse 13. <clears throat> Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, my brother, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take heed <clears throat> and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. And then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? And so he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater and there I will store my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. <clears throat> um, Jesus is preaching to a great crowd. And they, many, many have gathered to hear him preach. And he is speaking to them about the great issues of life and eternity. And he is telling them something so profound and something yet so simple. He says to them that if they fear God, they wouldn't have to fear anything else or anyone else. Amen. And as Jesus is preaching, this is a, <laughs> like the passage that we just got through reading. As Jesus is preaching, and if you start from the very first verse, he's preaching to literally thousands of people. And as he's preaching, there's a man who elbows his way through the crowd. Can you see him elbowing his way through the crowd? And he comes up to Jesus. And he throws out to Jesus something which is totally unrelated to what Jesus is saying. And I wonder, what, where did this come from? But you notice what the man says. Teacher, he yells out, bid my brother to divide the inheritance with me. I don't know about you, the preachers in this room and the teachers in this room can understand the frustration that Jesus might have been experiencing because he's, he's heavy into his sermon. He, he's wanting to make a very important point. And here comes this guy, elbows his way through the crowd, and he talks about something that's totally unrelated to what Jesus is saying. Will you please tell my brother to share the inheritance with me? Um, apparently his father has died. And he and his brother are squabbling over the inheritance. He was the younger brother, apparently, because of, of the two brothers, because the laws of Israel favored the oldest brother. The oldest brother got two-thirds of the inheritance, and the youngest brother got a third of the inheritance. And that's because the oldest brother got the farm, and he had to work the farm, and so the father would leave him more. 
but somehow the division of the inheritance wasn't coming off right. And this young man, this young brother is very frustrated with his older brother. So he comes to Jesus thinking that Jesus has done so many wonderful things. He must have an answer for this as well. Now, of course, you and I know that this would not be the first time, nor the last, that families engage in a cold war or hot court fight over the inheritance. You know what this is all about. For this young man, the inheritance was everything. For him, somehow, if things didn't go right, his life would be ruined. The birds wouldn't sing just the same way. You know, life wouldn't be the same for him. And so Jesus turns to this young man, and in a rather abrupt and gruff way, unlike him, he says to him, man, who made me a divider or a judge over you? I'm not a county judge. I'm not a lawyer. That's not my business. Jesus, of course, uh, wasn't saying that that wasn't important. Jesus knew that we need judges. Jesus knows that we need lawyers. But Jesus is saying, that's not my business. And then Jesus turns to the crowd. And he changes his whole tone of the sermon that he was giving at first. And he says to the crowd, and to the young man, and to you, and to me, And he says, beware of covetousness. For a person's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. This word covetousness is an interesting word, so I kind of looked it up. Covetousness, as you know, is an old, old word. I think it's an old English word, and it's not used very much anymore. The NIV has a kind of a nicer translation. It says greed. So we can kind of, most of us can understand greed. Uh, but covetousness is a word that we don't, it doesn't get much attention anymore. I, I have never had anybody come up to me and say, Pastor, I'd like to talk to you about my problem with covetousness. <laughs> uh, I've never had that. I've never seen anybody stand up at prayer meeting and say, Pastor, I'd like to talk to you about my problem, not only my problem with covetousness, but I want to tell you, Pastor, that I used to covet a lot, but I've gotten over that. I've never had that happen either. But covetousness must be important to God because you will remember that he ends his Ten Commandments with covetousness. He ends, you shall not covet. That's that's the Tenth Commandment. Bible students believe that the Tenth Commandment is a summary of all the other nine. Remember that. When you study the Ten Commandments, remember when you come to the Tenth, remember that this is a summary of all the other nine. In fact, do you know the difference between the Tenth Commandments and all the other nine commandments? You see, my friend, listen, the, the, the first nine deal with outward actions. Study it. You'll see it. The first nine commandments deal basically with outward actions. The Tenth Commandment deals with inner attitudes and inner motives. Covetousness deals with the recesses of the heart. You see, you can break this one commandment and no one will ever know about it. No one can accuse you of of covetousness because it lurks inside of the mind. Only when it produces fruit, only when it produces fruit can you be convicted of being a covetous person. And we all know the fruit of covetousness. Of course, we all know the fruit of covetousness is theft and and murder, and adultery, and all the other stuff, all the other nines that have been broken. Greed. In fact, the other day, I got to tell you, we all have, we all have, we all share with this, and you're honest with yourself. I, I was driving home from church one night, and I'm, I'm on US 1, you know, and I'm, I come to a stop sign, and there's, I mean, a traffic light, and there's this wonderful, beautiful, gorgeous car that just comes right alongside of mine. And I have a 2000 Ford Taurus. And, you know, I got to admit, I looked over there and I says, wow, how does he rate? Or she, you know? <laughs> Beautiful white car. I don't know what it was. Can't even, but it's a, I could tell it's a very, very expensive car. And I says, man, I can almost see myself sitting behind that wheel. <laughs> and somehow there's a little word that says, remember, Lou, that you're working on a sermon, covetousness. <laughs> yeah. Covetousness. 
I heard an interesting definition of covetousness. And as I realize, as I tell you, that that Tenth Commandment gets to me because that Tenth Commandment, listen, my friends, that's the, the Tenth, covetousness is the sin that leads to all other sins. So it's a summary of, of, of the whole Ten Commandments. And so the, I was trying to find a, a definition, and I came across a definition of covetousness I never heard before. I want to share it with you this morning because it's an interesting, interesting definition. Listen to it. Covetousness is wanting more and more of what I have enough of already. Yeah. Jesus says, beware of it. Beware of wanting more and more of what you have enough of already. Because a person's life does not consist of the things that he or she possesses. And I asked my question, when Jesus says that, the, that life does not consist of the things that we possess, what kinds of things is he talking about? All just things. You know, big things, little things. Things that we wear, things that we live in, things we ride in, the things that we purchase on credit. Things. And Jesus, Jesus came to tell us, Jesus came to tell us, beware of wanting more and more of what you have enough of already. For life does not consist in the abundance of your possessions. And yet, I know as well as, as well as you know that we live in a culture that in a thousand different ways insists that life does consist of things. Isn't that right? That's the culture that we live in. That's the message we get bombarded every day with. You see it on a hundred different billboards as you drive down the highway. You read it in full color ads in magazines. It is on radio, it is on TV, it is on everywhere. We are bombarded a hundred times a day that life does consist of things. Um... Jesus said it's not true. <laughs> it's not true. Beware of covetousness. Beware of wanting more and more of what you have enough of already. And then in order to nail down that truth into our lives, he does what he does so well, he tells a story. He wants to nail down that truth into your life and mine, and so he does it by telling a story. It's the story of a man who, in his culture, in our culture, in our world, would have been labeled a success, a great success. And you know as well as I do that in the ancient world and in the modern world as well, people spell success with dollar signs rather than with S's. You know that, right? And so the man would have been looked upon as a high achiever. And you know, listen, my friend, Jesus loves high achievers. There's nothing wrong. In fact, God wants us all to be successful. God wants us all to be high achievers. God, Jesus, no, he has nothing to say. He has nothing against rich, richness. And, and that's not wrong because some of the great men and women in the Bible, you know, were people of wealth. God's kingdom has been and continues to be advanced by people of wealth. So God has nothing to say about that. He's not really concerned about that. But listen to me, friend. For every verse in the Bible that tells you about the benefits of wealth, there are at least seven that warn you about the dangers of wealth. Because it is one thing for you to have money it is another thing for money to have you. You see, money, money has a way of binding us to that which is temporal and blinding us to that which is eternal. You see, it's not wrong in itself, we know that, but it's a dangerous blessing. It's a dangerous blessing. 
And so the man in Jesus' story was wealthy. He was a hard worker. He was very prosperous, very, very progressive. He was the kind of person that we all envy. He's the kind of person that we emulate and we want our children to emulate. Until one night something happened and changed everything. And Jesus tells the story in detail. And I want to just kind of help to paint the picture for you here this morning. And so one night, the rich man sits across the desk from the architect in town. And sprawled out there in front of them are the blueprints. <laughs> the blueprints. And they talk about the blueprints. The, man, the rich man says, you know, you know, I was once known as the best farmer in all of Judah. And then I became the best farmer in the whole Jordan Valley. But now with these plans, with the blueprints, with the, th the things that this will produce, I'm going to be known as the best farmer, the most wealthy farmer in all of Israel. And so they work the plans. The rich man's wife comes in and tells him, Honey, you know you've been up every night late for the last three weeks. Um, it's time. Why don't you go to bed? And she, she, he assures her that he will be in soon. She kisses him goodnight and the two men go back to the plan, to the drawing board. And about an hour or so later, the architect says, you know, it's getting kind of late. I really have to get home. Um, I will take these changes that we've made here this evening with me. I will redraw them and I'll bring them back again tomorrow. I'll let you look at them and we'll see where we go from there. The rich man sees the architect to the door. They say good night, and the rich man closes the door. He goes to bed for a little while, but he can't sleep. He's tossing and turning. And so he gets up and he goes back to his desk. He figures out, he says, I got to figure all this out. He figures it all out. He says, so much for the barns, this new barn, so much for the new house, this beautiful new house that we're building, so much for the insurance, so much for the taxes, so much for the, and then all of a sudden there's a knock on the door. He's about, he gets up and he's about to answer it, and all of a sudden he senses a presence in the room. And the rich man says, who are you? And the presence says, I'm death. The rich man says, well, what do you want? Death says, I've come for you. Remember, this is a parable. The rich man says, this is crazy. I didn't have you in my appointment book. I didn't know you were coming. Death says, I don't make appointments. I just come. I've come to count you out. Ten. Nine. The rich man says, wait, 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 wait a minute. This isn't fair. You, you never told me you were coming. That says, told you. I told you many times. I told you when your partner died a year and a half ago. I told you every time a funeral procession walked by the front door. I told you every time that you read the obituary in the column of the newspaper. I told you, but you weren't listening. But no matter. Eight. Seven. Six. The rich man says, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Look, we can make a bargain. Take half of my wealth and let me go. Let me live. I'm not ready for this. Death says, I have no need of your things. Five, four, three, two. The rich man jumps in and says, look, look, he says, take it all. Take the barns, take the houses, take everything. Just please let me live. And death with its smile counts him out. He prepared for life, and the very things that he prepared for were taken away. And so the next morning, his wife comes down and sees him slumped across his desk and goes to awaken him and discovers that he's gone, he's dead. He's been so busy building barns and building up his business that he's built up a tremendous amount of stress and, he, and it got to him. There's a lot of weeping in the home. 
weeping in the community, and, and soon they have a funeral. Some, the people of the community, of course, you know, gather around to give, pay their respects, and eventually they have the funeral. Someone gets up and gives the eulogy. They say that this man made his mark in the community, you know, what they say at funerals. They, they, you know, that, and they say that all the young men ought to emulate this man. They all ought to emulate this man. They all said the right things. And then they go out to the cemetery. They buried him and everybody else goes home. And over that grave, they put a stone with his name, his birthday, his death date. But that night, my friends, the angel of God walked through that cemetery and over the tombstone wrote a single solitary word. I am reminded that this man was not an atheist. He believed in God. He was a very good Jew. But Jesus' point is this, that if you believe God exists, and for all practical purposes you live your lives as if He didn't, God says, you're a fool. Wow. Wow. Jesus said at some point in life, you and I need to go out to a cemetery and stand there and realize that the statistics on death are very impressive. One out of one person's die. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? And you see, my friends, we've been hearing an awful lot about health plans it doesn't matter. No matter what health plan you have, you can't beat the odds. You need to take a good look at life and say, is this what I'm doing? Is this, is this what I'm living for? Whatever it is that we're doing in life, we each need to realize, is this all there is to life? Is this all I'm living for? Yeah. And in the light of the fact that we're going to die, is the price worth the game that we're playing? And so Jesus says, so is he who is rich towards himself but is not rich towards God. And he says it again, beware of covetousness. Beware of wanting more and more of what you have enough of already. For a person's life does not consist of the things that he possesses. Okay, Jesus, thank you so much. But please, tell me, <laughs> what does life consist of then? And my friend, <laughs> it's so simple. Um, it's so simple. What does life consist of? Jesus says basically it's, it's two things. Two things. We heard it sung in the music a little while ago. Life consists of trust. Trusting God. Life consists of advancing the kingdom of God. Amen. Those two areas is what Jesus, I wish we all could fully understand. It consists of just learning how to trust God. Notice, if you will, in your, in your Bible, and we're going to read this time from the NIV, verses 22 and 23 of that same chapter. Verse 22 and 23. 
Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothes. Consider the ravens, he says. Consider the ravens, the birds. They do not sow or reap. They have no storehouse or barn, and yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than birds? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Jesus is right to the point. Life consists of learning how to trust God <laughs> for everything. And he says, don't make, don't make all the things of this world concerned. Leave that with God. Then he illustrates his, his whole point by using three illustrations from nature. And I love his three illustrations from nature. The birds of the air, the ravens specifically. The NIV says ravens. And I wonder, ravens, look at verses 24 and 20, through 26 of the same chapter. 24 to 26, he says, consider the ravens. They do not sow, reap, they have no storehouse or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than birds? And I says, why did God use, why did Jesus use this illustration of raven? You know, he could have used a dove. I mean, the dove is so much beautiful than the raven. Ravens are scavengers. Ravens are ugly. But God uses a, a raven. And I remember, oh, I remember in Old Testament times, Elijah the prophet was fed for six months by ravens. And I used to ask myself, God, why didn't you at least send a dove to feed the man? Something a little bit more attractive. And now I get it. I realize it. You see, my friends, listen, back in those days, ravens, ravens were considered the lowest class, the lowest level in creation. And I says, wow. The ravens were among the lower rank of living creatures. And so, in their coming and going, this is the point that Jesus is making and God was trying to make to Elijah. In their coming and going, God is aware of their needs. They do not plant or, or, or store grain, and yet God feeds them. And if He cares for them, how much more will He care for us, His people, who are made in His image? And then God says, I suppose that by worrying, we can knock off a few hours from your life, but you cannot add any time by worrying. The other two illustrations that Jesus uses are the lilies of the valley and the, and, and the grass. The grass that withers and dies. Uh, flowers are beautiful, but they also wither and die. Look at verse 27. Look at verse 27 with me. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They do not labor or, or spin. And yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? Do you not, do not set your heart on what you eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after those things, such things. Your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom and these things will be given to you. The two things that Jesus makes clear as you read through, the, he says, one thing, learn to trust me. Trust me. What does life consist of? It consists of learning how to trust God. Your life and my life is a whole life. How do I learn to trust you, Lord? How do I learn to trust you from day to day? How do I trust you with my career? How do I trust you with my family? How do I trust you with my health? How do I trust you with everything that I have, Lord? It's learning how to trust God. That's what life is all about. The second thing that life is so important about that Jesus makes so clear in this story, he says life is also about advancing the kingdom of God. How can I help to advance God's kingdom on earth? How can I share his goodness with someone else? Jesus is saying, if you worry about those two things, I'll add everything else to it as well. I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty good. But it's a hard, listen, I admit, it's pretty hard sometimes to learn to trust God when things are not looking so good, when things are down. Lord, how do I trust you in this situation? And God says, just learn to trust me. You see, for God, 
God longs for disciples whose identity is so secure in Him that they graciously and generously pursue kingdom values. That's why he says there in verse 27. Did I read verse 27 already? Yes, I did. Okay. Wow. You see, my friends, this is something that's so clear. It's come to me so clearly as I study this. You see, if you live your life for things, listen carefully. If you live your life for things, ultimately they will leave you or you will leave them. And you will lose God in the process. That's serious stuff. And so he is saying to us, center your life in Jesus Christ and his kingdom and these other things will be added to you as well. So in other words, God is saying so clearly, don't worry, trust me, he says. Don't worry, advance my kingdom. Don't worry, be obedient. Don't worry, be faithful. Don't worry, return to me a faithful tithe and a generous offering. God and God will take care of you. I want to close with another parable because I like parables very much. It's really a parable. It's, a, it's about a servant who was perhaps, who was not very bright, who was not known as a very bright servant. And one day in, in, in anger, his master came to him and says, you know, you got to be the most stupidest ma servant I've ever met. And that's not very complimentary, is it? And then he says, I want you, I want you to, to come here. He says, I want to give you this staff. And I want you to leave this, my home and go out through the valleys and meet people. And if you meet somebody more stupid than yourself, give him the staff. <laughs> and to show you how stupid the servant really was, he, he did what the master asked him to do. And he went around with a staff in his hand. Everywhere he went, he was looking. He, he met a lot of stupid people, but never quite sure that they were as worse off than he was. And so a couple of years later, he returns back to the palace and he meets, he sees his master and he notices his master is not doing so well. His master is in bed and he's sick. And so the master said to him, servant, I'm going on a long journey. And the master, master, have you, have you got things prepared for the journey? The master said, no, I haven't made much preparation for it. And the servant said, master, when will you be back? I won't be back from this journey. And the servant said, master, could you have made preparation for the journey? And the master said, yes, I, I had a lifetime to do it. I was just too busy with other things. And the servant said, Master, you knew you were going on a journey. You were not coming back. You could have made preparations, but you didn't. Yes, I guess that's the case. And then the servant took the staff that he still had in his hand. <laughs> and he said, Sir, you better take this with you. For at last I have met a man more stupid than myself. <laughs> Beware of covetousness. Beware of wanting more and more of what you have enough of already. Life does not consist of the stuff you possess. Seek first His kingdom. Put that at the very center of your life. And all these other things will take their proper place. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Well, I have an announcement to make to you this morning. You know, at the end of this year, 2013, December 31st, I will complete 41 years of denominational service for the Adventist Church. Amen. 41 years. It's hard to believe that time has gone by so quickly, but it has. And so I plan to retire at the end of this year. I tell you, I've, I've, uh, my wife tells me, uh, we've been thinking about this for some time, and she says to me, Lou, you've got to tell the people how old you are. Most of you know, I think. Some of you haven't come to How old is he? Well, I'm going to be 70 in, in December the 6th. I'll be 70 years of age. 
We've been here over eight years, almost nine. It'll be nine years in October, in, excuse me, in February. Connie is not retiring right now, so she is going to be, she's going to be working a little longer. So we're going to be here for another year or so. We'll be coming and worshiping with you from time to time. We will really enjoy that. It's been a wonderful, wonderful eight, over eight and a half years that we've been here. You have been very kind and very gracious to us. You're a wonderful family, and we truly, truly do love you. Um, and as I say, we will have time here still with you, and we look forward to that. And um, so we will be here around until the last of the year. And then after that, as I say, we'll be, I will be retiring. Now, the ministerial department of the, co of the conference will be in contact with the church board in a few weeks, in a week or two. And so they will be here to talk to you all about um, who's coming in next and so forth. But um, make it a matter of prayer. Whoever comes in, we know that you will. And once again, we just want to thank you for being the family that you have been to us. We, th we praise God for the time that we have spent here with you. And may the Lord continue to bless you, and we know that he will. It's been a wonderful pleasure working with the pastors of this church. We have worked with Pastor, of course, Monsalve and Pastor Smith uh, for almost three years now. Uh, we have worked with other pastors that have been here, Pastor Cunha and other, many other pastors, uh, not others, he and other youth pastors. So we have been really enjoying, we have enjoyed it here. So God bless this church. He will continue to bless it. And we will not be too far away, so we'll be coming back again. Since many of you are already standing, <laughs> let's sing together our closing hymn, number 330, Take My Life and Let It Be. Take myself and I 
Gracious Father, we are so thankful this morning that um, you have told us again and again that life is all about trusting you. Life is all about advancing your kingdom here on this earth. And so, so Lord, as we have read and as we have studied that beautiful parable today, we realize that it didn't end very well for the rich man. But Father, we know that thy spirit is a wonderful, loving spirit. And we are, we are just being reminded here today of, of, of your goodness and of your love. And so we leave here today encouraged to know that you love us, each one of us. And that we are to put our trust and our faith completely in you. Knowing that you will take care of us regardless of what our needs may be. Bless us to this end is my prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.